every spiritual blessing you have. And now we see this idea that heaven and earth are meeting in Christ, in us. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning that we can come as your people and be in this place. Lord, I ask this morning as I preach that your word would flow out of me, that it isn't about me, but it's about what you have said to us. Lord, open our hearts to see what you have for us this morning. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Back in, I think it was 2018, Chelsea and I decided we wanted to go out and check out Big Ben National Park. And we'd never been there. I'd been to a bunch of different, um, well, I had been there. Chelsea had not. We'd never been together. And it was on our list of places we wanted to go. So we planned a whole trip. And we go out there. We have a campsite that's actually outside the national park. But we're, we're just doing all these great hikes. We're going to see all these kinds of different things. Well, one morning, we woke up really early because we wanted to watch the sunrise over Santa Elena Canyon, which is this canyon that follows the Rio Grande River right there on the border at Big Bend. And so we said, let's go, let's, let's sit and watch. And so we go and we sit and watch the sunrise, and it was brilliant. And there had been this hike that Chelsea had really wanted to do. It's called Cattail Falls. And she had been reading about it. She found it on some, like, chat group of locals saying, this is the hike that most people don't know about. And then especially it had been a very rainy season for Big Bend. Now, what had happened was my hiking boots of like probably 10 years had flat tired and blown out the soles on both boots in the same hike two days earlier. So I'm wearing a pair of Nike basketball shoes that I had brought as just like an old pair of shoes to have around camp that were comfortable. And we knew that this hike was going to be six miles round trip. And I'm thinking, no way. So I told Chelsea the night before, I'm like, I just don't think I can do it in those shoes. It's just not going to work out. But then the sunrise got me, right? And I was like, look at how beautiful this is. And Chelsea made promises about how cool this hike would be. Okay. So we start this hike, and the hike is on what used to be an old road. What had happened was this area had been overhiked, so they shut down this gravel road so that the access to it, you really had to hike to do it. It basically added an extra two miles to the hike. Now, I was in basketball shoes, and it was this very rocky ground because it's this old road, and it wasn't like nice, like, you know, crushed granite gravel. It was like river rock Every step you're taking, are you going to twist your ankle or not? Gravel. But then we get to what was the original parking lot, and we start getting up into the high desert. And this is what it looked like as we got up into that area. Still very much desert. And I'm just sitting going, okay, we've made it to this point. What are we going to do now? Did we really just come to do this six-mile round-trip hike and there's nothing here but a bunch of scrub brush, and I guess the mountains are nice. Well, as you look at this picture, this is what happens when you bend that corner down kind of in the middle. Give me the next picture, Jonathan. It's literally what I'd envision, just the chain. I don't know what I would have envisioned, but it was this moment of going from scrub brush and nothing, and literally you go over a rock, and it is this beautiful tree-lined oasis. And we were there so early that we just got to sit. And this is what that sit looked like. If you can give me the next one, Jonathan. It was just this beautiful moment where no one else was there and we sat at this beautiful pool with the water that was coming out of the Chisos Basin, filling up this crystal clear pond, and we had it to ourselves. And we just sat and rested in this beautiful, beautiful moment. When I think of places where I go, where are those places I find peace? There are very few times in the world where I go, I was as at peace as I was 
just sitting with Chelsea at the base of this small waterfall in the morning in Big Bend National Park. I didn't know it did that. I didn't watch to the end of this video. Jonathan, you can go ahead and give me the next one, yeah. I want you to think of that place, the last place you felt peace. The last place you were in where you felt that kind of feeling. For me, like it, it probably wasn't, you know, there have been places since then, but this was that place that I had put in the effort, I had walked there, I'd gotten there, and now here it was, I had gained that moment of peace. And I think in our lives, so often, we look at the Christian life as one where we are trying to hike and pursue and get to this place of peace. This place where we can sit at the foot in the oasis that God has created and we can finally say, I've made it. I put in the hard work, now here I am. And we can just sit and have that place. And I think the book of Ephesians, as we're going to spend the next three weeks in it, gives us some insight into how that works and I think should change our outlook. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to walk verse by verse through our reading. So if you have a Bible with you, if you have an app on your phone, which is how you read your Bible, Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3 this morning. So Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So let's just slow down there for just a second and look and say, as we read this, blessed be God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with one spiritual blessing, with every spiritual blessing. We're going to try that again. That was a conductor saying, your turn now. All right, with one spiritual blessing, with every spiritual blessing. So Blessed be God the Father who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every, okay, we're going to try one more time, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, and he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, we could just spend the rest of today on those two verses. That's all we need, but we're going to pull it apart even more. But I love here, as Paul writes, he says, listen, first off, you want to know every spiritual blessing? You have it. Why? Because God, in his master plan, gave it to you in Christ. And not only that, it is in the heavenly places. It's the storehouses of God. And he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now we're going to get some language here that's going to give us a little bit of pause to go. We're going to talk about before the foundation of the world. We're going to look at saying predestined and we're going to talk about that word. But what I want you to think is that you have every spiritual blessing in Christ and you had it before the world was created. Because our temptation as people of God is that we look and say, yeah, God has given me this blessing, but then we start questioning, has he really? And Paul's emphasis here is not only have you received every spiritual blessing, you have had it since before the foundation of the world because God knew you and would say that you are holy and blameless before him. Now, why are you holy and blameless before him? We go back up to the top. Because Christ has given us every spiritual blessing. Verse 5 through 10. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus. So this word predestined can get us tripped up because there's this idea of talking about predestination, which is then us trying to figure out, am I going to heaven or am I not? And looking and saying, okay, we got to figure out who's predestined. But that's not what God is saying here. He's not saying, listen, I'll tell you who's predestined and who isn't. He's saying, I decide who's predestined. And if you are baptized into Jesus, you are predestined. He knew that was coming. The question is not how do we figure out. It is the blessing that he has revealed to us that when we become part of the body, he knew that it was predestined. 
So we don't spend our time, time trying to figure out who's predestined and who isn't. We say, we point to the fact that Jesus said, if this, then that. If you are in him, then you were predestined. The question isn't about going, who are the certain elect people? It's saying, no, those who are baptized in our, are. And so if they are, then we want more people to join in. Because then we know once they've been baptized and brought into the family, then we can say, see, they were predestined. Our job is not to figure out the formula. We know the formula. When you are baptized into the family, God knew that before the foundation of the world. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So this is an interesting moment here, in the beloved. If you were to pull that word apart, if you take it and back to the Greek, it's going to be this word agapao, which is from the verb agape, which is the love that God has for his people through Christ. So when he says here, when Paul writes and says, in the beloved, he's saying, in the one whose love is the foundation. He's saying, this one is so beloved that his love is the one we use for redemption. So it's more than just saying that Jesus is the beloved, it's saying he is the beloved who beloves. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I want us to pause on that phrase for a second. The riches of of his grace. What God has given to us in Christ Jesus is the riches of his grace. He has given to us the storehouse of heaven has been flung open and it has been given to us from God. And I want you to think in these verses Hold on to the idea of what did I do to get these riches? Now let's keep going. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, which he lavished upon us. So what did you do to get this? Nothing. God flung open the doors and said, these belong to you. In all wisdom and insight, and I love this section of these verses in all wisdom and insight. So we go back, okay, the riches of his grace, he lavishes them upon us. And why does he do it? Because it is his wisdom and his insight. If you ever are in a spot where you go, am I worthy of what God is giving to me? Stop and remember at that moment you are questioning the wisdom and insight of God. That in his wisdom and his insight, he deemed it necessary to lavish the riches of grace upon you. Making known to us the mystery of his will. How often are you in a moment where you're going, Lord, I just want to know your will? You don't have to look any further. He opened up the mystery. The mystery of his will that he makes known to us is that he would lavish his riches upon us. That he would open up the storehouses of heaven. That he would give us his grace. Because in Christ... He has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. There is a uniting force that happens 
when the riches of God invade earth through God's people and into them. And it is the place where heaven and earth come crashing together. Now notice it also says, a plan for the fullness of time. Paul would write elsewhere, we see but through a mirror darkly. So right now we see this idea that heaven and earth are meeting in Christ, in us, and we kind of see it. But in the fullness of time, it will become a perfect and observable thing. As we are told, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And in that place, when Christ returns again, we will see this all perfectly. Until then, we sit and wait for the fullness of time, knowing that this union of heaven and earth is still taking place in the people of God. where a perfect Savior invades an imperfect world. Verses 11 and 12. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of of his glory. So in him we have obtained an inheritance. We have been given what was rightfully Christ's on our behalf. And again we come back to predestined. This isn't about figuring out who is and who isn't. It is about saying this is what God says. He says you are predestined to receive this inheritance because it is according to his purposes. Now verse 12 here is an interesting one that we who were the first hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. Now, does this mean we're somehow praiseworthy of what God has done? Does that bring glory to us? No, what he's saying is those who first knew him will be used for the praise of his name. That people will look and say, look at how good God is because look at what he has done. Let's look at 13 and 14. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You who were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The full inheritance that we will receive is that through the blood and new life in Jesus, we are promised a resurrection to come. And one day that will happen for us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who guarantees that promise. You don't have to guarantee your inheritance. God sends the Holy Spirit to be your guarantee. To look and to say you have what he has given to you. So sit in it. And here's what I mean by that. We could easily look and say, the journey of the Christian life is to get up and go and to do and all of these things. It's to reach the oasis. It's to go through the desert and then we can be there. And what I'm telling you is you're already there. So often we strive and we look and we try and find. And what Jesus is saying through Paul in this first chapter of Ephesians is he's saying, you have it. It is already yours. And not only is it already yours, it is with you wherever you go. What we often try and do is look at our faith and say, where can I find those spots of oasis that I'm walking through this world, I'm struggling to figure everything out, I'm trying to get there, and I just want to find, Lord, that place where your peace and your grace dwell, and he's going, yes. It 
if the world and this life is a long desert, what we get to be is the mobile oasis. That when Jesus pours his love on us, when the riches of grace are lavished upon us, wherever we go, Christ is there. That that lavishing, that brilliance is that when we try and seek more and more to say, Lord, where are you? He is sitting there saying, I am here. What does a good father require for a child to receive their inheritance? Sonship. Daughtership. Jesus is not looking for you to earn this inheritance. He's not looking for you to find the secret oasis, that secret spot where finally you'll understand. He's saying, no, it is here and it is with you because I have given it to you. For us, this call as we walk through the book of Ephesians to sit is not about looking and saying, let me find that spot. It's not about hiking through the desert. It's not about those things. It's about saying, where you are, you are Christ's. Where you are, you belong to him. Because what we try and make God's riches about is about doing. And what he has made it about is identity. Here in these verses of Ephesians, what he's telling us is it is lavished upon us. It is the grace of God for us. It is his riches, and they are all ours already. That in fact, our sinfulness is trying to find a way to make them ours, to gain them more, when all we have to realize is it's already here. That the good news of Jesus for us is that he predestined, we didn't have to. That we can trust that before the foundation of the world, he knew. And instead of leaning into trying to discover this secret place where we can finally find peace, what if we stopped and let go of our sinful drive to discover it ourselves and listen to the Spirit who said, I guaranteed that this is yours. That the good news and the freedom of the gospel is you don't have to chase it down. It chased you down. That as you're looking for that oasis in the desert, it is already with you. Jesus declares, I am the living water. And what Paul will do through the book of Ephesians as we spend time in it over the coming weeks is he will look and he will show us, listen, stop trying to make this about all these other things and instead rest in the promise. Rest in that place. Know that wherever you go, I have done what needs doing. The action of sitting is not about you saying, I'm going to finally sit down. It's about the Holy Spirit giving you a spiritual swift kick to the legs and saying, sit sweeps the knee. Leg. Ah, that quote was close. And he says, you're here. You've made it. Because what I want us to think about is that as Jesus comes in, he will transform everything. 
that if we are stopping and resting, because the Spirit is saying, here I am, it is going to change how everything else functions. Because there is a calling on our lives to be a people and a certain type of people that God calls us to be. But if we get it out of order and we start saying, I must be that person, instead of saying, I'm in the oasis and it goes with me wherever I go because the Spirit has claimed me, we will find ourselves downtrodden and running out of energy, trying constantly to fulfill a checklist of God that he hasn't called us to. But instead, if we can step back and say, Lord, I am seeking and I am searching, and we listen to him where he says, in my wisdom, in my insight, in my love, I have opened up the storehouses of heaven, and here are the riches of grace, and you don't have to look for them. They're yours. You don't have to come out and say, I must do these things, Lord, to obtain them. He goes, no, 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 stop. They're yours. You are a son and daughter of the kingdom. By right, I have given you access through my son to everything. To peace, to strength, to hope. Now, We are still humans tethered here, again, seeing through a mirror dimly. So there will be times where we say, but Lord, I am hopeless. But Lord, I am directionless. But Lord, I am tired. And he goes, right. Stop. You are in me. The sin we commit is when we try to reach God even though we know that he has reached us. Being in peace and in this place isn't about saying I have to attain it. It's about the wisdom and righteousness of God already being upon us. And that will be a lifelong journey, (laughs) again, of the guarantor of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit, just stopping us and being like you are here. If you leave with one thing today, remember this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. The cool water, the pool, the oasis, the place of rest is not something you are looking to obtain as some form of nirvana. It is the blessing of heaven already given to you in your baptism. And they want it. And in that place, that's where we begin. That is where we end. That is where we live. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for all the good things that you've given to us. But Lord, this morning may we remember over and over again the riches of your grace. Lord, that you have given to us and lavished upon us through your wisdom this inheritance. Lord, may we stop trying to obtain it, stop trying to seek it, and instead stop and say, Holy Spirit, bring me there. Not of my will, Lord, but of yours. May we stop trying to make this about achievements and instead rest in our identity. Lord, give us permission and force us to sit in the overwhelming and never-ending love that you have for us. In your son Jesus' name, amen.